Hi everyone and welcome back to Getting There the Podcast with me, Brogan. Today I sit down with Rachel Bruno Hardy as we discuss what it was like having her father as heavyweight champion of the world how she's begun to carve out her career away from her dad's identity, her upcoming sporting challenges, and the lesson she's learned that she doesn't want to pass on to her children. Join me as we sit down for a very interesting episode. Thank you for coming here today. Thank you for having me. So normally I'd like to I asked my guests to introduce themselves. So without any further ado, Rachel Bruno Hardy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I am Rachel Bruno Hardy. Um, People obviously know me. I'm the daughter of the legendary Frank Bruno. Um, But also I am a PT online and in person as well personal trainer amazing so I don't think we can go any further than you without touching on it yeah daughter of Frank Bruno I think I mean we had this conversation offline because what's going on out at the minute isn't it it's all like the fury stuff and the camps and I think it's the first time we're starting to see a real insight of like what actually goes on behind the scenes yeah so can you tell me what it was like I mean your dad fought for 14 years didn't he yeah heavyweight champion of the world Mm mm-hmm what was life like for you in the midst of that fame, fortune and his boxing? So I think obviously naturally everyone feels like a daughter of the legendary Frank Bruno's celebrity status is all roses and amazing, which don't get me wrong, there were lovely moments. There were some beautiful moments. So I'm really grateful for the life I had. But there was a lot of darkness, I think, with his career um, and his fame. Uh, came a lot of dark darkness and, and trauma and... Um, especially him publicly, openly talking about that he has bipolar. That was quite hard to grow up, being a teenager, growing up with a dad with bipolar, but also in the public eye as well. So, um, but there was some beautiful moments. When you go back and look at it, it was lovely, but there was also a lot of trauma. In those 14 years of him fighting, so I recently watched your dad and me documentary, which, by the way, is amazing. So we need to start a little poll to get that back out because it's so prevalent especially now, yeah. but um, I watched young Rachel in a bedroom and your dad was filming you and he was like, I'm off to camp and you just like broke down and you cried. And what I really want to touch on today is those 14 years when he was in the height of his fame, what did life look like for you? So what, what were the camps like? What were the impact it had on the family? Did you have relationships with paparazzi? How did that work? Yeah, so we weren't allowed to go to his camps. Like he would do like six months camps at a time. Six months? Because he had to be in that, mindset of um being away from the kids you've got to be in that fighting mindset so he would be away a lot and we weren't really allowed to go and see him um so I think I remember that clip because it's been used a few times and it, it I'm not good at goodbyes now I don't like goodbyes um I used to struggle a lot when my dad used to go because we'd have him for a little bit at home and then he'd go again so it'd like just there were moments obviously of like we could breathe if he'd gone because he's he was quite regimented growing up he was quite strict um, and obviously his bipolar ways were quite manic to be around, but I still didn't like him going. Um, and But that was a sacrifice I know he had to do for us as kids to have the life we did. So I didn't know any different, but having him, he, he got to the top of his game and having him there, it it was amazing, but I don't feel like he's ever settled and and can be happy being a family man and that's what the shame of it is like he my dad got to the top of his game the best of the best in his career and that's all he ever wanted but then he really struggled to be but where do you go from there and I know it's so silly but like you look at Britney Spears you're watching this stuff with Tyson Fury you are the best in the world like it's like it's almost like it's hard to come back down from like where do you go from there were you allowed to go and watch him fight as a child? So the only fight I ever went and saw was him in 95, the one he lost to Tyson. Because I was nine, so I was young, so obviously my mum was trying to protect us. My sister went to a few more, because she, she was four years older, but went to that last fight. And um, it was kind of traumatic, because obviously I'm nine years old in Vegas. It was at the MGM Grand. You must remember um, it. See, I do. I've got such a bad memory, and I think I shut off a lot. Uh, uh, um, in, in my childhood. So Trauma I do, responses. I think so, and I shut it off to be able to, it's a coping mechanism. Um, but that, it was, a, it, was, it was amazing, right? We got on 
flew first class. We had all these amazing interviews and things. And obviously, me and my sister carried the belt into the ring. Oh, don't. Um, this just made me go cold. And, and it was. And you think, it was an amazing... But, like, we, I was nine. And I remember Tyson, because he was coming out first, because my dad had the belt. And he had a whole team of people around him shouting, you the man, you the man. They pushed us out of the way. Um, didn't have a care in the world for us at all. We were young. We probably shouldn't have been there. Um, and then we were in the ring. And my dad lost. And literally, the press were, like trying to get, I was hysterical because I had this big cut in his eye. My mum's cuddling me. And um, we had to just get my dad out of the country, get him out because obviously that was the last fight he ever did. And it was quite traumatic. Um, what was that like? He steps off the ring. Do you remember what he was like? He was just so sad. He was. He, he knew that was it. He, he probably shouldn't, looking back, have done that fight so soon. because it was. But that was the only chop, opportunity he had to probably... He had to take the opportunity at the time. So he wasn't prepared. He did lose. And he knew that that was the end. So you can imagine, like, he's, he's, he won't have... He had to have stitches, wouldn't have it done there. We get back on... Um, I remember we flew Virgin. And everyone then found out Frank Bruno's on the flight. So then they had to put air hostesses in front of the curtain to stop people coming just to see him because he was so badly beaten up. Um, and I knew that day, my dad, he wasn't OK. He was down, which I get. You've just got to the top. Of where you want to be, and um, that was the end of his career and the kind of di downward spiral to. Um, because he wasn't allowed to physically fight on doctor's orders because no. he was going to go blind. He had a det detached retina; it had already been operated on, so somehow he obviously managed to get the license to fight and things. But he shouldn't have done it because my dad's eyesight is terrible; like it's really bad. Um, but I think he knew in his heart, like that was payday that was the last opportunity to be in the ring he had to do that well, so I was watching this Ricky Hatton documentary actually recently and it was yeah. the same thing and when you watch they were just pushed by the teams because yeah. they don't become people they become a business a business a brand and, it, and my dad was that and the saddest thing is when you're in the height of that the team of people that you have around you is insane as soon as you retire they're gone and I think to myself, where are they now? And it's like I've watched the Tyson Fury documentary and I've only just finished it last night because it really hit home. Like Tyson is openly, talks about his bipolar, which my dad didn't do back then. Only, only now is he aware of it. Um, and everything, his traits and the way he was live it to live with is so similar to my dad. The only difference with my dad actually was okay to retire um, and has been able to pile out a career but the saddest thing is Tyson isn't able to stop yet. And I think a lot of sports people probably must have that drive. Do you think the bipolar existed before the fall? Yes. Um, he's, I, th I personally feel like he had it as a child. Um, he was a naughty kid, he, but he was sent to boarding school, like a really naughty boarding school because his parents couldn't really didn't know how to handle him. I think had he been in this generation now, my dad probably wouldn't have been in the situations he got himself in, you know, but... Would have been supported differently. I think so, because I think, like, people, like, your parents, like, if my kids ever are faced with something in the future, like, I know how to deal with things now, because the conversation is open to it, but no one really knew what he was going through. Yeah, and I think, even going back, I mean, it wasn't that long ago you'd done the documentary, it was in 2014, mm. so just, like, under 10 years ago, I bet it was, it was probably a little bit heavy for people to look at. I mean, I watched you in the documentary... You felt awkward. Obviously. I felt awkward watching it. You could see how vulnerable he was. Yeah. And it's like, then people weren't having those conversations. Yeah. And you can see, like, obviously from the conversations we've had, and even from watching the documentary, like, you're the one who's trying to communicate with people. But back then, there was so much shame yeah. and guilt. But you just touched on it. What was his childhood like? Did he have a level of trauma that you think that developed into this yeah, mental illness? I, I, I don't, so we've never had that conversation because I, I, I struggle to have the, like my dad, like with me, especially when we did that documentary, um, where, where it's hard to have them raw conversations. I, th I, I, I want to say something has happened because I think things can stem from trauma, but he's never had that conversation with me, so I don't know. But something's got to have happened. It, it is a chemical imbalance. Um, and it does need to be treated a lot of the time, sometimes a medication. But my dad, um, when he let me do that documentary, like he had just come out of being, se had been sectioned. So he was so heavily sedated in his low ebb, coming off a big mania high. So I was quite, I, I struggled to like watch it back because I was so. What made you do it? I wanted, I wanted to get closer to him. 
Um, it was a way to be able to sort of bond with him and make him be proud, but open up that conversation because I don't feel like there was a lot, there is a lot of help out there for the carers of someone with mental health issues. And um, just being able to sort of share our journey in the hope it might help someone else. Because when we were going through it as kids, there wasn't any help. We were hounded by the press. We were young. They were trying to get into the secure unit to film him, get the picture, get the shot. And it wasn't done nicely. So I just wanted to share our story to try and help people. Whose idea was it to do it? It was mine. I was approached by, I was approached by BBC Three first. And, um, and obviously my dad, I think, originally was like, no. Because obviously he didn't, he's never shown that vulnerable side to no. the public. No and he's, ever... he's meant to be like an absolute weapon, like a man-destroying machine, a and, jawbreaker. And, and then all of a sudden it, he's crying on TV. Like, Yeah, he was hunched over. He was really down, very heavily stated, slurring. Um... So I'm really ha- grateful that he let me do that. I am. And it was, it is still, like, I probably will go back and watch it because it's always like a bit of therapy yeah. uh, to watch something like that um, for me. But I just want to try and spread awareness of mental health and just to know that people aren't alone if you are going through things like that. Because I think so many people suffer with mental health issues. How do you think it's impacted your life? It's made me stronger. Um, over the years, I've gone in waves. I think when I was younger, it affected me a lot. I probably... Uh, my college years went a bit wild because I didn't know how to cope with all these feelings and having a dad that you didn't know where he was at half the time because he, if he was in a manic episode, you didn't he wouldn't answer his phone or he'd, he'd lose the phone and he, we didn't live near him. So it did shape me and it has shaped me and I think um made me realise like for me in my relationships, I like a bit of security, like my husband. I like... um like he's my stable, he's my support and my comfort and my safety. I couldn't, I don't think, I know it's really horrible to say, I don't think I could be in a relationship with someone who's got bipolar, because it is... Well, you all suffer the effects. So what do, does yeah. a manic episode, or what did it look like to you back then? God, just like so erratic. Um, like little little things, uh, he, he didn't sleep a lot, so then he'll be out in his music room all nights and extravagant buy-in to the point of like, you can't just have one thing, it'll be hundreds of like items um, in the house, like cars, clothes, just going down my local high street at one point in a really bad manic episode with no shoes on, weights around his ankles, which I asked him before and he was like, well, that's fine, I'm, I'm just working out. I had cor- corns on my feet. Like, Dad, that's that's not really a normal behaviour. No self-awareness. No, and, and, like, and actually at the time didn't know anything was wrong. Um, and so he thought there was nothing wrong with him going down Brentwood High Road with his weights on. Nothing, thought nothing was wrong. Going for MP, which... I was about to talk to you that. Yeah. So in, a thou- in 2001, he took for a conservative seat for Brentwood and Ongar, yes. and his tagline was, don't be a be plank, plank and vote for, for Frank. Yeah, honestly. So talk me through this. You're at home, and he's like, Rach, I've come up with this great idea. Which I'm embarrassed. Like, can you imagine? <laughs> you're, I'm young, right? Growing up, I'm, I'm in school. My friends are going, oh, I heard your dad's going up for local MP. Vote for, uh, don't be a plank, vote for Frank. And I'm like... He's a joker, and I get that. He likes to make people laugh, but that, for me, that was embarrassing. Like, he's not really... I'm not putting him down, but I can't see him being an MP. Um, Whose really. idea was that? God, no, I, don't, I think it could be. His. It could have been his at the time, his mania. So how far did he get with his Thank seat? Thank God, not far, because I think, yeah, not far. Just a couple of flies around Brentwood and on It was longer. just a little, uh, yes, and that was that idea. Because, again, ideas used to pop up, and uh, like, he's doing this. like Similar to what Tyson's doing on his documentary. Like, he come up with an idea and it has to happen, which... Thank God that got squashed. Well, going back to your documentary again that you did with it, I mean, I think it's amazing. And you were interviewing a guy who was super successful as well and has gone through a similar thing of losing it. And you asked him the question saying, did it help you get to where you were at? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was like, yeah, it's almost like a blessing and a curse. So from your experience and all the stuff that you've done on that documentary, do you think it's like this bipolar? Do you think it's like a nature over nurture? Do you think these kind of environments don't help like what See, I what think you I do genuinely think a lot of successful high achievers have something because to be that driven and successful it, it, it's, it's a motivation that not a lot of like standard people have so I, I, it's a blessing in a way if you can control it so when he was boxing the amount of training he was doing every day that masked it and kept it at bay a lot of the time but then obviously when you've got to come back to earth and reality and obviously that stops all that fight camp and training that's when 
normal life, you can't control those urges and obviously your mental well-being. So I just, it's, and that man now sadly has passed now. And it's like, oh, if you don't, if you don't maintain and control your mania, sometimes you can never come back from that. Like your brain is so damaged and exhausted that, that you can't, re- you can't repair that. So it's not good to be in them levels of mania too long. So I was watching, so when you were talking to him and, and you went off camera and you were like, he's like a zombie and you asked him what meds he was on and he didn't even know. Yeah. I mean, is that is that is that a relationship like that with medication now? Has he had to continue that for the whole of his life? Is he still a zombie or has he got back no, into No, so he's not a zombie now. So he's now on... I don't know what he's on now, but he's on something that is just going to keep him at bay. Obviously, he uses all his tools, his exercise, but he's... They have to put you that high, highly medicated when you, when you get sectioned because, obviously, he was in a mania that he wasn't sleeping for days. So had they not got him off that high, it's dangerous, right? You don't even know what kind of situations you're getting yourself into. Because so, I'm right in saying that the police actually tricked him and drugged him yeah. and he was violent to the police and took you seven hours to get him into an ambulance. That's the first time he was sectioned, yeah. That, was, and that was in 2001, right? Yeah. So that, 2003, yeah. 2003, sorry. I think that was 2003 that was. So, and they and by the time they'd take, taken seven hours, they had ambulance and the police there, um, they, it created a hysteria with the press. So they were all outside. We had the iron gates and things, but they were outside hounding. So then by that time... The kind of the chill um, section that we were hoping for for him wasn't the case. They did have to trick him. They did. I think they did. They don't do it now. It's all PC. You're not allowed to go and trip someone up and, and, and inject them now. But at that time, 2003, that was it's able. 20 years ago. I know. So that they, they could do that. And um, and I get it. He was scared. He'd ne- That was the first time he'd ever been sectioned. He'd. We tried to do the whole priory. We tried to do it the calm say go in voluntary and then you could but he kept checking himself out and he wasn't getting the help he needed so for a lot of years after that um every time he's been ill our relationship is affected because once he comes around and he's off that high he's kind of down for a little while and blameful yep um yeah, blameful, doesn't, didn't like us a lot. And that's sad because I've, I, I've been reflecting on our relationship and it's gone in waves for years because he, he gets angry at us. Because even if I would t- ring him and say, Dad, you sound a bit manic today, he'd take offence to that. It's so interesting. So obviously you and I have a parent who is mm. an alcoholic and I've suffered with things like this my whole life, like having to put them into rehab facilities and things like that. And that just really landed with me, like mm. what you said, it's waves, but you're dealing with people who have mental health in waves. I know. So it's like... It's hard. But I know from my own personal trauma, like the amount of rehabs and things we've had to do with your life through my parents' life and how it. I actually think sometimes it affects, especially children, like when you're responsible for that person and it's like yeah. the responsibility well, flips, yeah. right? And it weighs with you so heavy. Yeah. And... Um, how was that like? How did you feel in 2003 was, when he went into his It was first hard. Um, like, I, I, and I, I'd, I'd met my husband, who I'm with now at the time. So um, thank God I had him. He kind of helped me through a lot of it. But I struggled because losing... My dad wasn't around with, with his career. That was, that was obviously the choice he had to do to give us the life. But then he wasn't around when he, he retired. It was even worse because his behaviour was so erratic and up and down. It's like, I had lost him again. And had I, I didn't realise, obviously, we're going to go on a few years losing our relationship all the time, up and down. And it was just, it's just hard because I don't have daddy issues. I worked a lot on it. But I just wish things had been a bit different, you know? Um, and I, I want that to be different for my children. I don't want them to have an absent father. I don't want them to have um, stress-strained relationships because I sh- us as kids, we shouldn't have had to be the parent. As, as, as we were a lot of the times. And that's a really sad, we had to grow up quite quick. Like I had to have a, a strong head on my shoulders all the time and it, it shouldn't have had to be that way. And it's not just the person, right? It's everyone else. Like how was your mum in all of that? Hard, like my mum had obviously gone, was going through a high public profile divorce, quite a traumatic, turbulent re- marriage relationship. And he is and was the love of her life. They, they are soulmates, but just can't be together. Um, and she stuck, she stuck around and she was there. She even went to the hospital, visited, which she didn't have to do. Because um, it did put her through a lot in the marriage. Um, so I had not only all of our siblings were trying to all deal. When, when you're all so close and connected and struggling with stuff, 
it, it's really hard because you just you just come to blows a lot a, a, yeah. as siblings and things. So it was tough. There was no one at home. We all lived together. There was not. We couldn't talk about it without getting into bust ups and fights. And it was it was a really stressful. Well, everyone's time. heightened, aren't they? So as heightened. Well. And like even when he, how long was he sectioned for? I think it was it was the section which the which the um, my times and dates. Are so, so you wrong. were first sectioned in two thousand and three, and then. I and that's like the standard section. Twenty twelve. Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to say a couple of months. I'm going to say at least eight weeks he was in there that time. Um, but were you allowed to see him? Yes, yeah, so we were. And um, and actually in that documentary, I went back and visited. It wasn't still there, the ward. But my dad was in an NHS hospital. Um, they had three three locked doors, like secure doors that you have to go in and lock it. Because obviously... They're going to try and get out. They are. But they're <laughs> yeah. all, and the weirdest and thing is laugh. they're all waiting there at the door for you. All, and my dad was one of them. So they're all like... Zombied waiting there. I can there. laugh about this now because it was 20 years ago, right? But at the time, they're all like zombies waiting to say, help me. Like to get, get, me, out, out, get of me out of here. And my dad was waiting there with them. And I'm like, oh my God. Um, and I even one, one joke, my dad tried to set my sister up. With one yeah, of, I was going to... Yeah. yeah, he was so off his head that he was trying to set your set sister up with the smoking area. And I'm like, what? I'm like, oh my God, this is like, is this the real... So is it up to... So when you're sectioned, yeah. I think it's... I've got it written here, something. It is um, one of the acts. Yeah. Um, when do they... Can you be infinitively sectioned yes. or... so? 100%, yeah. So he was probably thinking... I might not even come out of this. Yeah, and people don't. Like, people, they have the power over you. And I think that's what my dad was really angry that's with. That's what that I us would... as children decided to go ahead with this. But we tried everything. I honestly believe he wouldn't be here. I was about to ask you. I honestly believe he, won't, he wouldn't be here if we hadn't done that section. Because his behaviour and what he was doing, um, he, I, I believe, like, he would have ended up dead. Because... And we had to do that. And obviously someone at the time told him that we had done this, which I'm really angry for because that affected our relationship for years. He, We went in there and he was fuming. He was so angry. How can you do this to me? And all, I think he can see it now, but obviously we did that out of love. It's a lot to carry as well. So much. We did that out of love for him. Like, had we not done that, Dad, would you be here? No. Um, and uh, all your, your siblings, they all, they all have a... Friends with him? Yeah, yeah. We have different relationships, but because he lives so far away and he's a workaholic and... So what does he do now then? So he's, he's got his own um, Frank Bruno Foundation. Which amazing. Which is like non-contact boxing, which is amazing for children with mental health issues. Um, and then he does a lot of evenings with Frank Bruno. So he's constantly working in the evenings. And that would be the time I probably could go there because I work myself. Um, so at the minute, we don't get to see him as much as we like, which I know we should all make time, but it's just really... Really difficult. I've got to a stage where I'm I'm in the process. I've got two young kids that are five year old and two year old, and I work, so I can't be on that motorway. No, and they need your attention for three hours every night just to go. So I'm trying. My goal for next year would be to try and get him nearer. Yeah. So we could then just pop in, give him dinner, pop round there. You know, um, it's a goal, but <laughs> let's see. You spoke earlier about um, this life of luxury that you lived led when you yes. grew up, and I suppose financially and stuff did things change when he went downhill like well yeah because obviously so obviously my mum and dad weren't together but my mum was was we were we had still had a nice life it wasn't as what it was when we lived with my dad but the things did change like he was spending fortunes like, even now to the point like if you actually probably honestly asked him like what how much money did you waste in your manic episodes on things It'd be crazy. And I know that he's an adult. He can do what he wants with it. But um, wasted so much. And Has not... it taught you the value of money, though? Did you feel like you were spoiled growing up because you were the son of someone See, with no. all of this legacy or not? See, we weren't. I think because of my mum and dad's upbringing, we always had chores. We always were grounded. We never could get whatever we wanted. We were not... Like, we had, obviously, nicer things. And we lived in a lovely house and it's did sort of a beautiful swimming pool. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah we, wow. had, we did have, the, like, an amazing life. Um, but we we were grounded with that. We weren't. We could. We couldn't just get what I wanted all the time. Um, had to work hard for chores. Like I grew up having horses, and I would get up at four, five o'clock for school, do them, do get home, do, and then compete on weekends. Like I had. I'm, I'm grateful actually because they they gave me the foundations and the morals and the. That some some tools that I would like to go forward in, like mine. He could have almost children. gone the other way, gone like, Rach, take it, take it, take it, if yeah, he's been manic. But yeah, no, he didn't. But he, oh, he was he even tighter, I think. Did, yeah. yeah, or just yeah. more for me. Yeah. Can we just touch on that, interestingly? So, 
did, so obviously your mum's white, your dad's black. Yep. 20, 30 years ago, would, did you suffer any like racism or things like, because obviously yeah. the world was a different place. That if, well, I mean, imagine when they probably got together, what? God, the, How was... Years ago, so my mum, bless her, love her. Like, so I mean, we used to go to Jamaica quite a lot because we had family out there. So we'd go have a holiday and then obviously get take them to things uh, and give them gifts and take them things out there as well. But I remember once someone in Jamaica was like, oh, where's your mum? And I was like, oh, this is my mum here. They're like, no, that's the nanny, where's your mum? And it, because they, they couldn't fathom a mixed relationship. Yeah. Um. So there was a lot of race, racism growing up. I think even my dad's career, he got a lot of stick for marrying a white woman, but it's it, it's frustrating. Um. And we grew up in a predominantly white area. Like we grew up in Ongar, so Brentwood. Yeah. We probably were the only, there wasn't a lot of black people in the schools that I went to. So I probably was the only mixed race person. So it's quite tough. Um, Did you suffer any racism there? Yeah, I got yeah, I got caught. I got bullied at school, but I, I think more that was ignorance. Looking back, it it was ignorance and the fact they thought I was something I wasn't. You know, um, a bit of jealousy as I well. Th- yeah, it? looking back, because the, the 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 bully has actually later on apologised to me because she came into a place of where I was working. Isn't um, that nice? Which is lovely, but I'm like, cheers. Uh, yeah, a little bit too at late. The time, <laughs> you had everyone in class like yeah. really calling me the N word. Lovely. Um, and the weirdest thing is I was the one who got told off for that because I said I was going to punch her face in. She called me the N-word. Um, and I said, okay, me outside, I'll punch your face in. And, and I, we were, I went to a Catholic school and the, and the, the, the nun got a mum in the office and was, was like, she is um, the daughter of a boxer. That is his profession. So I find it really bad that she's using that term, punch. I know. And, uh, and so she's I, called you the N-word. N-word and she got away with it. So um, that was just all little things. It was hard. Um, but it hasn't shaped me. I don't... I'm lucky now. Nowadays, it's so much easier. There's like my kids are even more mixed. Like cause my husband's yeah. white, so um, I'm hoping for the future they won't get. Yeah, and I think it's going back to just what you were saying before. Like certain things, obviously, even like in the generation we live, like when yeah. we went to school, um, you could could say then, but couldn't say now. And like, I mean, the pa- uh, the paparazzi, like when your dad got arrested, were like bonkers. Bruno That's locked awesome. up. Yeah, they, they could- had to reprint that day. The Did back, they? The backlash that they got. Cause my dad was the first celebrity to get sectioned ever. Like, and publicly, yeah. Um, and they they printed Bonkers Bruno and they had so much backlash from the public that they had to reprint and apologise. Because obviously, and they had a picture of him with the ambulance. Yeah, I've the seen it. Maybe yeah. we'll get it up on here. Yeah. When we... Um, which was awful. And that, I know we've come on leaps and bounds in 20 years. We have. Like, the, the, the press are better I feel like even there was a, there was um, a reporter recently I think has gone through the hospital or whatever, but um, that they left him alone. Like now, I do feel like you wouldn't be so hounded as much. They do respect your privacy a little so bit. They were more. climbing over your gates. They went Awful. to the psychiatric unit, you no, know, and trying, trying to get to through get those. Door. Yeah, trying to, and uh, we have to have like, obviously protocols in place when my dad is sectioned that we to protect his privacy. Um, and they were trying to get in. It's, and then we're grieving and going through this ourselves. Traumatised. I was like literally traumatised because obviously we've never done this. And our dad is potentially really poorly. Um, and they were awful. And everyone will say, but that's that's the part and parcel with what comes with being a celebrity and fame. That is what puts me off ever being famous. I wouldn't want that. Because being hounded, followed, like, you couldn't even go on holiday, couldn't go to Lakeside. Like we'd have to go out the back, back door because everyone's... No one used to respect respect that that we we haven't seen my dad in ages. We just want to have a bit of time to go shopping, and then everyone once one person starts like a knock on effect, you're hounded and surrounded. Does that by still people. happen now? Not as badly, like, but it happens where people just take a picture when you're eating, and my dad gets upset because like, look, you can have a picture, but just let me. Don't take it while I'm eating. <laughs> Don't just do that. <laughs> well, I got all this around my face. Like, got a mouthful of food. He's like, come over. Just when we finish, let me have a meal with my family, and then you can come over and do have as many photos and chat as, as much as you want. But it used to be so bad. Like, and my dad didn't have security or anything like that. We didn't have anyone, which I looking back, we probably should have, because someone could have just took us. Hundred percent. Really? Like, we had letter bombs. We couldn't open our own post because people the letter bombing. We was living in that era. Um, so. That's, you probably, couldn't open the letters just no it? at one point because obviously there was like a scare of people sending letter bombs. so what were you doing just giving them someone else to open someone else yeah someone else <laughs> Some too, also you? somewhere <laughs> else was getting blown up honestly so it, it was our life was crazy like mental it, it was mental and um but at the time as a kid i knew no different and it was fun like there's a little there's, there's things with my dad's mania that i remember me and my sister were chatting the other week we're like we kind of like him a little bit manic 
but not the the full manic because that's when yeah. he's more present and fun or and actually wants to know like give you a call and ring you but when he's on a bit of the down you don't hear from him you don't you don't you're not really interested in whatever you're up to very blah but what i've come to realize and i think maybe you have too is that you can't save them no no yeah you can't and i spent so many years trying to save so many people and and i felt like i had a duty to care of all of these people mm. and not necessarily the shoe would be on the other foot if it come yeah. to me and it's like i this, can't that, save you that is what do you know what i had a thought about that the other day like little things like if god if i i don't know why it popped into my head like if i ever had to go into hospital who like, would look after kids no seriously but i like love my dad dearly but i don't think he would be like my mum is my like my best friend like he probably would be like i'm working sorry i'm a bit busy i'll come later like um he's always too busy and i'm not putting myself out there all the time to run myself into the ground anymore to to be there um because and i've that, got my own family to yeah, take care of and that of. took me a long time to learn that like even to now like we've been filming in here and we've had some people in here on their journey are getting there, right? And they've been mm. really vulnerable. And when we finished, James is like, broken, you can't keep saving everyone. And funny enough, like a few things have happened days after and I'm getting phone calls and I'm like, it's just but so hard. Yeah. yeah, because yeah. When, when you've had that role of like saviour and the figurehead of the family and things, you just kind of like take that on. Yeah. But you've, um, you are like the eptoponym of being a child of a high achiever. Yeah. Um, how did you find like trying to carve out your identity away from him? It's, I, it honestly has been tough. Like I'm 37 now, and I'm only just becoming really in my 30s successful. Um, I struggled working out what I actually wanted to do. I went to drama school. I thought I was going to try and be an actress and things. And I did. There was a point that I wanted to try and be famous, like my dad, and like make him really proud. But I didn't know what to do. And I, being his daughter, there's always it's I, I would lie about my name because I wanted people to get to know me or hire me for me. You know, I didn't so want to. What would you say then? I'd say my na name was Rachel Brown. It's honestly crazy. So I when did... you're in the acting world, you're coming along as Rachel Brown. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? But then I got to a point. I was like, Do you know what? Actually, my dad has co contacts. I know contacts, and has, has got an, had an amazing career. So use it. So now I'm like, I've got into fitness when I was 30, which I should have done years ago. It's like something that, you know, you just, but it wasn't the right time. Um, and I'm, I've become more successful now. I've got my children. Cause I think they've given me a drive, drive that I knew, I never knew I needed. Like at one point I probably, there was an opportunity for me to be a stay at home mum. I could have done that. Like my husband could have supported us, but I just wasn't, I didn't feel whole. Like I love my I children, you. but I didn't feel whole just being with them. I needed me and my own identity. And like, I've done a lot of work. I'm trying, still continue to do a lot of work, but I want to be the best role model and I'm the most, and, and earn my own money and my own right on this earth. Um, and that's and so applaudable. Yeah. It's amazing. So how did you get into fitness? Because I assume it always was lingering. You see, it was always there and I've yeah. always done it, but I just never really thought of it as a career. And it was like my 30th birthday. So my husband approached me and I've always thought my 30th, going to get a Chanel. Like, no, it could be yeah. really, uh, <laughs> sound really shallow. But We're not from Essex. <laughs> I was like, I really wanted a Chanel handbag on the 30th. And it got to there and he was like, do you want it? And I was like, do you know what? I don't. I was like, he, I, I, said, I think I want to do this PT course. And he was like, okay, so then instead of the Chanel, I got the PT course. And I thought to myself, do you know what? If you want it and you earn your money, you can buy it yourself. And I've got to that point now where I could buy it myself and I still haven't. Don't, I don't see the value in it. I just, I've got the girls now. I don't think that's actually, I, I don't need that as a bag now, right now. I need a mum bag, you know? And it's, um, don't guess out, it might in the future get one. But I just am so glad I took that PT course seven years ago, that opportunity, because in these seven years, what I've, carved out and and done i'm so proud of not i just want to keep doing more so talk to me the last seven years how's yeah. like you've done this course yeah did it what was that like and then how because i mean you are the trainer for like one of the biggest apps in the world which yeah. is the courtney black app courtney black you app, specialist yeah. in pre and, pre and post, post yeah so i mean wow i know i mean considering you've only been doing it seven years and there people have been doing it a lifetime i know i give their right arm to be and where I'm, you are. i think i'm grateful for my acting so i think that wasn't wasted because i think that's helped me on camera and it, it's i've got this natural presence on camera i think that we, which works for the online industry but i also work in person for my own got my own little pt studio bruno fitness Amazing. in essex so i do that as well and then obviously i'm trying to get into i've always never stopped trying to do mental health and trying to do more spread awareness like do podcasts 
um, and and more awareness, especially for the carer side of things. I want to help try and do. But I that's seven years now, and I think where could I be in another seven years? How important do you think physical fitness or that is important to the whole mental health? So, so important. Like that is one of my tools I use to help me. I do suffer quite, I'm a quite an anxious person, quite highly strung. And I think, like, I think all hospitals should have a really good gym unit. Um, do any of them have that? They're, they're not good. Like the ones I've been to with my dad, they're awful. Like they're, they're the NHS, which is fine, but they're, they're really not great gyms at all. And I, I think you need that, like to get up in the morning and move. You haven't got to go and do low, even walking, go out there and get a bit of fresh air. I think it's a really big part of your mental wellness and your journey. Um, it can keep you kind of on a, on a level. There is a point where it can become a bit obsessive, I think, but just finding it exercise and using that as a tool is so helpful. Yeah. And I try and tell everyone, get out there and walk, do something, got to. So how would your clients describe you? Probably mental. Uh, <laughs> see, I read my clients. I get it uh, from my dad. Yeah, I get it from my dad. Crazy. <laughs> so I'm a bit of a beast. I'm not yeah. gonna lie. So beast mode. Yeah, clients would say beast mode. Um, do you push them then? I do because I feel like I want to get the best out of my clients. And if I'm not training them, they probably just go in the gym and go on the cross trainer. Nothing running, just going in the cross trainer. But I want them to be conditioned, like be fit, be an all round health. So we use weights, we use all the conditioning, fun stuff, and. Um, which they might moan and text me and say, I hate you, but <laughs> I just want them to get, and most of them come in hating it, but leave loving it. So they love me for that. And I'm the counsellor as well. I was just about to say that. They yeah. probably come and it's like a bit of, a, of an outlet. I'm I, My personal style of being a personal trainer, I'm a counsellor as well. I'm there for you. Um, I'm not someone that's going to write you a diet plan and tell you to eat a Tupperware, protein oats and all that. That's not me. I am someone that wants to help your mental wellness as well. And I really, I train, I only train women really. Okay. Um, I will, I would train men, but I prefer to train women. And a lot of them are mums. So I, I'm relatable and I want them, mums, to find something for them because you're always spinning so many plates for everyone else. A lot of mums don't put themselves first. And it's got to be enjoyable, right? Otherwise yeah. you're just punishing yourself in another form. I feel like I've done it before. I've done the whole bodybuilding uh, weight loss program for my wedding. and I don't. How enjoy... long was that for? Oh, I did it for like, I did a whole, I did it for a year before the wedding. Jesus. I, I, honestly, now I'm traumatised by it. It's <laughs> triggered What do you me. mean? What did you do? It's like eating protein oats with water. Like, for a year? Oh, I, I can't. It, it, makes me, it makes me gag when I think about it. Cause I, but I, yeah, I was lean and I, I looked good. Were you happy? But mentally, I wasn't in the best shape and I went into my pregnancy of my first daughter in a really bad headspace with my body um, because I was so punished lean it. and I'd, I'd put it under so much stress that I probably now think I've given myself IBS because of that because of the way I treated so it. So when you then got pregnant did you hit the fuck it switch like I'm gonna eat everything? I was huge. Honestly, I struggle to believe that you guys can't see how little she is and small. At the moment but I yeah. literally ballooned and then I had this thing I, I put on about four and a half stone do you think in nine months? And it's like, because I've been so strict for that, that year prior and, then, and my body just absorbed it all and I was... Well, I was reading this thing as well. It's like, we think our body is just this machine, but it's also got like, it needs this ability to like trust us and know like yeah. the times in my life where I've gone through... I, listen, do you know what? It's really interesting we're having this conversation because I don't care what you say. Yeah. Every single woman has some kind of form of body dysmorphia or 100%. image related stuff. Yes. And my... When I got pregnant was the only time I can say I healed with my body because I couldn't skip breakfast because I was being so sick that I was projecting that I had to have to. something in. I yep. had to not because I'd override hunger and just just we, ignore how it. How many women don't, honestly, I think women should ask, how many women probably don't, don't really eat breakfast, they don't have time, skip meals. And to be in that. Like, so, so, many... you, so what I found is like with that starvation, you yeah. came in the fight or flight. Yeah. And it's actually when I started to eat regularly and like, because I'd hit the fuck it switch. Right? So, oh, I've not, now I've eaten. Oh, I've had a lasagna because lasagna is so bad because it's, it's a carb. Not, it? I might as well have the chips. I might as well have the crease and I'm going to finish off. I'm going to have a family yeah. bag of galaxy because <laughs> I've hit the fuck it switch. Yeah. Whereas now it's like you can just enjoy that part. And so, yeah, I was reading somewhere uh -huh. as well. Like the more you actually start to nourish your body, the less you'll get it holds better results, onto it. and you'll yeah. get better results. Because like, if you're constantly badging and abusing your body, doing these hit workouts, constant craziness, right? Your body's going to hold. It's releasing cortisol, stress hormone, all the time. So then you, that's when a lot of people say, "I can't lose that last little bit of something," because you're, in, you're 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 putting your body under too much stress. If you actually look after it, nourish it, eat, 
eat food, nourish it, train. You can train hard, but you've got to do the rehabilitation work as well, like the, the yoga, even go swimming, the, the, the less impact stuff, walking. You haven't got to abuse your body all the time to get results. Is there a certain message or the same kind of like layout or schedule that you give to people or like what if you could pass a few things on to your clients mm. what what do you really try and ham home into them I just want them to one thing is do something for you because a lot of mums will always make it like, I'm not saying it's bad to make an excuse but they will always find a reason why they can't exercise right so and I know I I work I do work but I me and my husband we have we train right you've got so I will I always have a blanket you've got to do it get yourself three sessions in a week Get out there, even if you've got to, once you put the kids to bed, your husband's in for work or whatever, you get out there and you do your steps. Get your step count in and nourish. Don't start picking at your kids' foods because then people go to, often go to me, oh, I can't lose weight. I'm like, so what have you eaten actually eaten today? Like you grazed on your kids' food, a chicken nugget or a sausage or something that you don't actually want. It's cold. It's not that nice. So actually make yourself a hot meal. You, and they go, you haven't got time. You have. Make it when you're making the kids' food. That's what I do. I eat my dinner really early. So if anyone asked me to come out for dinner at seven, I would tell them no. Because <laughs> no, I'm like, are you mental? Seven, seven PM. That is. I saw this meme. It was like, like <laughs> there are two types of people in this world. It's nine o'clock, and it's only nine o'clock. Yeah, I, I'm. I eat my dinner with my kids at like half three, four. Like when they get in from school, we I cook, we eat then. So you wanted me to go out and eat at seven? I'm not even. Like, you are wild. <laughs> I'm having a wild night if you see me in a restaurant at seven. Yeah. So, like, just try it. I know it's hard, but eat with your kids and that. Like, make your dinner with them, and that will stop you grazing on theirs. That's extra calories that you're not accounting for. Yeah. You know? So, talking about your fitness, you've got a big challenge coming up next May, okay. haven't you? Do you yes. want to tell us a little bit about it, how you got so, roped into this one? Roped into it. Yeah, thanks, Brogan. <laughs> um, so, I got roped into fighting for Brogan's charity. Yes, you did. The yeah. Wicked's charity. So, it's on the 10th of May, the yeah. De Vere Connell Rooms. There's over 600 people in a room. Wow. What's happening? When's right. camp? Talk me through the next well, few I, months. I'm, I'm, I'm starting things now. I'm, I want to start on my fitness and conditioning, but I'm, we're going to go into camp in January. I'm taking it. I am so excited to take this seriously, right? I am going to stop drinking. Yeah. I love a wine. I am a wine. I'm a personal trainer that loves a wine. I don't think that's off limits. Human. So, yeah, I'm human. Yeah, yeah I'm human. Uh, so I'm actually going to take it really seriously. I'm going to go on a proper fight camp. I'm going to get the right nutritionist. I'm going to eat well, have the right good trainer. And I'm going to take it seriously because I I've, I can box. My dad always was like, you're good at boxing, but I've never been here. So that is going to be a shock. Like, I've actually got to get here. So, that's cause, that's, that's, so it's going to be scary, isn't it? How do you think you'll feel getting in the ring? Already I'm nervous. Like I am having like freaking out, but I'm going to be doing some good meditation. <laughs> I'm going like, to do this next to the stage. <laughs> Can Rachel come in the ring? I'm have to do something. Because, oh, listen, let's not fuck about, right? You're hey, Frank Bruno's there. daughter. You can't good. get knocked out. I can't lose. I, I can't lose. I, I, I literally cannot lose this. So it's embarrassing if I lose. No, 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 no. no, no. It's in my no, head already. I can't lose. I can't. Your dad would be like, she wasn't mine anyway. <laughs> You're like, yeah, she's not mine. Disowned. Disowned. Will he come watch you? Yes. He, uh, well, he says he is. We're, gonna, we're hoping he'll be there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell his PA that he's okay. got to keep his schedule free. Um, I'm probably I'll be honest. I've got already loads of people. My mum's devastated. She's like, she's maybe put them two different ends of the room. Well, yeah, we I probably <laughs> will have to put the separate. I might have to get two tables so yeah. my mum can go on one, my dad can go on the other. Awkward. Um, will you ask him for advice? I have. So I have already, and he said to me, "You got to get fit, and you need to stop drinking." I was like, "Oh, cheers, dad." Um, which I'm fit. I am. Like, I will. I love a challenge, and I think this has not come at a better time. Like I'm going to be 38 next year. I want to get in peak fitness for my 40th already. So I want to set myself a challenge that I've not done before. Well, you've just done all the challenges, haven't you, by becoming this far in your know, career yeah. in seven years. So it's like, this and is the next I step. I want more. And I want to be able to show mums out there that your life is not over when you have a kid. Like You yeah. can set, like if you want to do a challenge, you want to go and run a marathon, you can do it. Obviously, it's going to be really difficult for me to get training in. I'm probably going to have to do it in the evenings, which I'm in bed usually by eight. <laughs> so that's going to be a bit of a shock. You're going to like close your eyes and virtually <laughs> box in bed. So I, but I'm going to do it. I'm like, why not? Why shouldn't I do something for me now? But it was you know? so interesting because we had this discussion offline and we were just talking about the podcast and stuff. And we both said, oh, I just wish I'd started earlier. Right. And yeah. we're both like, we're both parents. Right. But I almost, like, and obviously, and I feel like obviously there's so many people ahead in the curve of what I'm doing, and you probably felt the same, like, in the fitness space, but yeah. no one's you. I know. 
And you've gone on to prove that in seven years to be at like one of the peak trainers in your industry know, yeah. to fight at this kind of event. So I think for any mums that are listening to us, yeah, it's never too it's late. It's never too late. No. And like, it's ridiculous, Rach, right? So we're going to live till we're what? 100? And we're sitting there at 30 and I'm like, do you know what? Stephen Bartlett's got it sorted. This one's... Who needs me? Yeah, do you know but what? I, no, no. So but I you're, think, you're you. Yeah, you're you. And also, at the minute, when we're our own generation where people, a lot of young people are becoming really successful young. So I think that's around us a lot. But I am someone who's 37 and, and, and only really got into my career later. It's never, ever too late. And there's no, then you're right. There isn't, there isn't someone that's you. So your uniqueness and you is your power. So go out there. If you want to start a new career, you can do it. Obviously, I think you have to work double, double the work when you're a mum. You do. You have to. Like, but I think they kind of push you as well because you think you, you work even harder, yeah. right? But what was life meant to look like for you? Little young Rachel that we saw on that videotape, which we're going to throw the clip in here. Oh. What, what did you think? life was going to look like? If you'd asked me that when I was younger, um, I thought I was going to be famous, like a famous movie star. I wanted to be on the stage. Um, that's why I went to drama school. I wanted to be an actress. Um, that is what I would have wanted uh, when I was younger. But actually now I'm living the life that I dreamed of. I am. Like I've got the most amazing husband. Obviously marriage isn't easy. You have to work at it. But we are... We've got two beautiful girls, we've got two dogs now, we're both successful, financially secure, and I'm living my dream life. So you're you're getting there? I'm getting there. No, I am, yeah. yeah. Getting there, yeah. Or are you there? No, getting there, getting okay, there. Okay, so yeah. what's the next bit then? What's the there? The there is... Because the there always moves, right? We've come to work on this show, right? It's like, yeah. So I'm like, oh, do you know what? I've got here now. <laughs> No, but then I'm like, oh no, I want this X amount more. I want yeah, we, and that's the yeah, thing. But we should never stop working uh, yeah. and striving for that more. We shouldn't. And no one really yeah. gets there. So no. what's the there then? God, come, you the tell there? me you're there because next week, next year you'll come back and go, I've done that. God, what is the there to keep building on my my own little PT studio and just working on me? Like I want to be the best mentally stable mother, mummy, I can be for my girls. So that is what I want to work on and get there just so I can be the most supportive, stable mum for them. I think we've had such an interesting conversation because it's like you're juggling so many plates. Like you're really spreading the awareness on the mental health, yeah. the fitness. You've got all these challenges coming up. Let's bring you back mid-camp oh and let's see what's happening. Let's see yeah. how you feel to get punched in the face. If I, do you know what? I'm, I because I, I have got that inner fight in me. I'm well, a you'll bit, be like, yeah. I, I think then I'm gonna be like, do you know what? But then you've got to control it, haven't you? That's the thing with boxing. You just can't go ham on a face. Can't, no. I, can't, I won't be able to breathe. I'll be puffing out. I'll be blowing out of my ass if I do that. So I literally, it'd be interesting. See how fitness wise. Will you want to know who your opponent is? Yeah, because I want to do my research in oh, case I, you, I, We don't tell yeah. you till a week before. No. Yeah. <laughs> You ain't going to get me some hell, girl. Are you? No. Right, I'm listen. Scared. There's something in that bag for you. In here? That's for you. D everyone gets excited. It's not from Letter Porter, but it's better. Um, for all of our guests that come on here, they yeah. get a little something take away. Oh, my God. Didn't know this. Oh, no. How do I open the box? Come on the show. You get a free. Get a gift. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be seeing a chunk of them on eBay soon. Wow, RBH. Oh, I love you. I've not got anything personalised with my, my ma married name. Oh, you do? Oh. What is it? Oh, my God. You're almost there. Yeah, get How in there. How cool is that? A little compass. It's giving me goosebumps. Oh, my God. Yeah, so it's like, because the, yeah. the compass, I like it because it's the journey, it's right? the journey. Oh, my God. Well, that thank you amazing. for coming on. Oh